Today is February 21st, 2017. The time is 7.15 p.m. and the regular meeting of the Greensburg Planning Commission is called to order. At this time, I'd like to ask everybody to silence all electronic devices and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under God for four years. Applying the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the city requests that participants in this meeting complete a voluntary anonymous survey that is available on the table in the back of the room. So you can place a survey there in the box. This time, no, this call roll. Tom? Here. Mark? Here. Kevin? Here. Jamie? Roy? Present. Bruce? Here. John? Here. All emailed minutes on the 16th. Um, Rod also gave us a copy here tonight to look at. Um, anybody have any additions or corrections to those minutes? Emailed them. Um, all right. Having heard none, I uh, welcome a motion to uh, approve the minutes as emailed with the corrections that were in those emailed minutes. So moved. Okay, Roy made the motion out a second. Mark seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Have you heard nothing? Minutes are approved as an email to the press. Okay, new business. Item number one. The public hearing is <coughs> considering a petition for a secondary plan of proposed oh, market yeah. state subdivision located along the south side of Park Road from approximately 520 feet east of County Road 150 West to approximately 1,300 feet east of County Road 150 West. Don? This is a case that you heard on primary plat in December of 2016. The property in question is located on the south side of Park Road, which is here, and slightly east of County Road 150 West is here and it's outlined on this map in orange. It's roughly 14 acres if I remember correctly. The proposed subdivision would create five lots with the one on the west being relatively large, 4.36 acres I think it is. The others are just a little over two acres each. They're pretty deep. They're 100 feet plus wide each one. In your December meeting, there were a couple of conditions on the approval of the primary plat. One, there are no roads proposed as a part of this subdivision. Everything would be served off of Park Road. There are no new sewer lines. There's an existing sewer line along the south side of Park Road, and there is an existing water line along the north side of Park Road that would serve the development you did at the request of the fire department require the installation of two fire hydrants that would be on the north side of Park Road and those have been installed. The other condition that you placed on the approval was the submission and approval of a stormwater management plan. Uh, the petitioner has uh, submitted a stormwater management plan. However, the stormwater management plan did not address the detention requirements that are included in our ordinance. Um, our ordinance requires that a 100-year uh, storm flow be released at or below a 10-year storm rate for the development. Um, I have had a discussion with the engineer that did the hydraulics hydrology work on this, and I uh, have not heard anything further. So as of the moment, I am not aware of any approved stormwater management. Beyond that, everything else appears to be in order. Any uh, commission members have any questions along? The easement that we talked about get wide. The easement down in this area is 55 feet wide, as shown on the current plat. And I believe originally that was 40 feet, and it's now 55. So, yes, it did get widened. Uh, 
motion from the audience have any items to address or speak to in this petition? Um, where did you all know me? Uh, we did uh, do the water analysis. Uh, we have Marty Mann here who did the, the water uh, report, the storm, storm water report. Um, he will come up and give his findings on the report. Um, we're not here to argue or, or, or cause problems, but we have an uh, issue that we think uh, he can address and, and possibly make a difference on the retention of that area. So I'll turn it over to Marty. Sure. Maybe uh, Sholey also. I'm sorry. My name is Martin Mann, uh, PE, Landwater Group Engineering out of Columbus. Um, appreciate being here tonight. I certainly have a lot of respect for what you guys do. I've served on boards like this myself. Um, drainage is a very complex issue in all communities. We do the best we can with ordinances and standards. Uh, sometimes you get situations that kind of fall on the margins. Um, in my professional opinion, this is a project that kind of falls in the margins of drainage because even though it's technically a subdivision, from a drainage standpoint, it's five houses being built next to each other. There's no streets being proposed. There's no storm sewer systems. There's no centralized collection system. When I first got this job, uh, I recognize that it was a low impact project in terms of what we look at in terms of drainage impacts, primarily because the size of the lots and the size of the overall subdivision versus the amount of impervious surfaces that are being added in the form of homes, patios, and driveways creates a relatively small increase in impervious surfaces increase. So when we have a situation like this, what we try to do is we try to do a computer model that simulates the existing conditions versus the proposed conditions. We try to look at both hydrology and hydraulics. Hydrology is the phenomenon of rainfall being converted to runoff. Once it gets to a, a centralized conveyance like a creek or a ditch, it becomes hydraulic. So what we did in this situation is we uh, got LIDAR mapping, which most of I think you guys are familiar with, uh, laser mapping, uh, one foot contour mapping inspected the drainage area, determined that there was a significant upstream watershed in, uh, in Winchester subdivision that was also draining through the site. So we delineated sub-basins, uh, both the project site itself and the upstream drainage area, and divided that into a handful of sub-basins. Then we measured the land surfaces, uh, impervious, pervious crops, roads, right-of-ways, uh, soil types, um, the slope of the watershed, things like that. We put that into a computer model uh, called TR20, which has been around forever, put out by the Soil Conservation Service back in the 60s. Uh, it's a pretty good model. And so we ran the model for the existing condition and proposed condition for, I think, 39 different storm events, something like that. Uh, two year, five year, 10 year, 25 year, 100 year, maybe even 50 year. And so what we try to do is say, okay, uh, for all these storm events, and we get stormwater, we get rainfall data from um, the DNR uh, Bolton 71 standardized design rainfall data that we use. So we run the model, and what we're trying to do is determine what the impacts of the project are, both on the site and in the downstream drainage system, which in this case is uh, an open ditch um, that subsequently drains down through the golf course uh, from the site. And so we, when we ran the computer model, what we determined is although um, on the site itself there's some impacts in terms of increases in runoff rates, because of the dilution effect of the upstream watershed, by the time the water gets to the ditch that runs through the site, the increases in hydrology are less than 1%. Uh, they're in the order of 0.2 to 0.5% increase. So if it was a, if you had 100 cubic feet per second, you might get 100.3 or 100.5, something like that. Then what we did is we ran computer models on the two downstream um, culverts, uh, County Road 150 and the driveway, which is right at the downstream property line. Um, and we ran a Federal Highway Administration HYA culvert performance uh, model. Basically, it looks at the flow rate for a given storm event and determines how much the water goes under the culvert, how much goes over the road, what kind of velocity increases you get. So we put the small increase in the hydrology that we got from the hydrology model into the 
HOIA model, and what we determined was the increase in height of the water um, was one hundredth to two hundredth of an inch, or I mean of a foot, which is, um, I don't know, less than a quarter of an inch. In my report, I related that impact to, it's kind of apples and oranges, but the Department of Natural Resources looked at 0.14 feet as sort of the threshold of negligibility in terms of floodway activities. Now, this isn't a floodway activity, but that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb standard. We try to, you know, obviously, if you put a storage shed behind your house, you're going to have some impact on runoff, but it's going to be very small. Well, in this situation, what we got was some increase, but a very small increase that did not translate to a hydraulic problem or a flooding problem. Had we found um, an increase of 1% or more or uh, above that 0.14 that DNR uses, we would have recommended detention. Uh, we did model detention. We did discuss it. We looked at the pros and cons from a practical standpoint. The, the problem with detention, and it, it makes no difference to me. I get paid either way. I'll get more money if I design detention. So I'm not an advocate for not, I'm just trying to, you know, provide the facts and answer questions. But in this situation, the houses, um, they're going to utilize natural drainage patterns. The swales uh, at the site, wood, pretty wooded grass areas. So water's going to come off the four corners of the house and dribble out into the yard and go down into sort of a natural drainage system. From a detention standpoint, if we were going to do detention, the really only way we could do it would be to dam up the ditch because a lot of the water's coming from the south of the ditch and a lot of it's coming from the south side of the houses. And they're, they're all, they're, they're all going to trickle down to the ditch kind of in a different path. Some will be sheet flow, some will be little swales. The problem is, is normally in a subdivision you've got a, a street and the water from the houses goes down to the street, goes into an inlet, goes into a storm sewer where you can intercept that storm sewer and put a detention pond or a basin in. In this case, we've got a diffuse surface water coming down to the ditch. So there's really no place to, to collect the water for detention other than damming up the ditch, which we can do. We can dam up that ditch uh, and create a, either a detention pond or a dry basin or a bioswale or something like that. Um, concerns I have about that is you're going to wind up disrupting the natural draining situation in order to accommodate a reduction in flow that is, based on the study, um, not really needed for any improvement or protection to the downstream system or properties. It would be kind of a, it would be kind of like a solution waiting for a problem to occur. And you've got some unavoidable potential con um, consequences of detention. Now every detention basin has some consequences. Uh, in this situation, I don't believe those consequences are being outweighed by a public benefit. Consequences in this case would be you've got farm tiles, and I know the farmer is concerned about farm tiles being blocked because if we dammed up the ditch, we're going to wind up creating a temporary impoundment during heavy rains. We'd probably use like a 24 inch pipe with like a four foot high dam across the ditch. And so when it rains really, really hard, water would stand there, potentially blocking farm tiles. I understand one of which maybe drains the basement. Um, there's a concern about um, corn stalks and things getting into yards, debris, trash. But of course, that occurs with any detention. Um, you've got um, an existing driveway at the downstream end of the site. The west end of the perimeter, you've got an existing driveway, uh, which I visited six or seven years ago when I was working for Mr. Kramer at the same site. And it already is sort of providing a de facto detention um, by blocking that channel. So if we did do detention, it would be a little bit redundant. It might provide a little bit more holding back the water than what that driveway does. But essentially, you've already got a certain de facto detention uh, effect out there. Um, so in summary, the, the, the project is a subdivision. But to me, it's a subdivision in name only because when I think about a subdivision from a drainage standpoint, most of the time it's got a new street, new storm sewer systems. Streets create most of the impervious areas because they're directly connected to the outlet. If you think about water coming off a house, it has to go through the yard. A lot of that gets absorbed in the yard. It, it absorbs onto plants. Uh, it tends to get filtered, whereas in a Typical subdivision, you've got 32 foot wide streets, which creates a lot of impervious area. The water's concentrated into a pipe, water comes shooting out, excuse me, through a, you know, maybe a 24 inch pipe, and you have a lot of erosive effect. You have a large increase in downstream flooding potential. This is kind of the opposite of that. You've got 
relatively well-established, good-sized downstream infrastructure and a relatively low impact. The other thing that I noticed when I did the modeling was there's a certain, uh, we call it beat the peak, it's not as popular as it used to be, but essentially what happens is it, by the time the water from Winchester gets down and the, 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 the flood crests at the site, most of the water from the site is already gone. So there's a certain concept that, and I've done a few of these studies, um, probably 30 or 40 of them over the years, um, and, what, and I didn't do it on this one because I thought the merits were so strong that they, didn't, they weren't necessary, but we could do that. And that is that, um, you know, you put the tension in, what you're doing is you're holding the water back so that it, when it comes out, it's coming out more in line with the timing of the upstream watersheds. And so your detention actually has a reverse effect because now you're adding on to the crest of the flood as it comes down from the watershed. Usually when you're this far down the watershed and you have a low impact site, you kind of want to get that water out. Uh, and so that's, what, and that's why the numbers reflected what they did. Um, uh, relative, you know, maybe a 10% increase in runoff from the site itself, but that 10% relates down to less than 1% because of the dilution effect and the timing effect of the upstream watershed overall. Uh, so our recommendation was not to require detention. Um, I told Ron when we talked on the phone, it, it didn't matter to me. I'm not an advocate, a politician, or a lawyer. I'm an engineer. I try to take my profession uh, professionally. I completely respect what you guys do and what determination you make. It won't make me cry whatsoever, whatever you guys decide. But I do want to come here tonight and make sure you were properly informed and answer any questions that I could because this is you know, very important to the community and to the developers, and uh, I want to make sure I get it right. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Be happy to try to fill in any gaps that you might have. I apologize if it gets kind of weedy. It's a very, this stuff is about, and your ordinance is really good, by the way. It, it's, it's not, I mean, you know, Indianapolis is 700 pages, and it's not quite that robust, but it's a really good ordinance. There's maybe a couple things that you could add down the road. Um, but, you know, this project is definitely on the mark. It's kind of a gray area project because, and I said to Ron, you're absolutely right, Ron. It's over 10 acres. It's 100 to 5 release rate. But the reason we go to 100 to 5, and I was involved in writing these ordinances back in the early 80s. So I've been doing this, you know, I've been on both sides. I worked for two different government agencies, DNR and the city of Indianapolis, and, uh, you know, have been involved in boards like this. And it's always hard to, you don't want to set a precedent. And that's why it's important to have a deliberative body. That's why it's important to have professionally certified reports because you don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry coming in and saying, I don't need detention. Uh, I just did wellage optical last year and we put underground detention in. And it was the opposite situation. Uh, a lot of increase in runoff going to a very sub <coughs> subpar draining system in an older neighborhood. Had we not put detention on that, we would have had flooding. Absolutely, we would have had flooding. Um, Commerce Park, we just did a detention basin for those guys. So, you know, I'm not against detention. I probably designed more detention um, in Greensburg and Columbus in the last 20 years than just about anybody. I'm a big advocate for it, but I think sometimes you've got to take a step back, you know, when you get these kind of gray area situations and see if you're going to do more harm than good. Mr. Mann, on this um, the letter I'm looking at, You're seeing some specific references. Um, um, I was trying to leap through this report and try to correlate item 1A and 1A, and I'm struggling. So. Well, the, a, the references on the A1, Andy, could you come and elucidate that just for a minute? Because we we put that the letter together sort of as a team, and the A references that Andy provided. And uh, when I wrote the report, I didn't use the same characterization, so there's a little bit of an apples and oranges uh, aspect to the. Just a copy of the I'm just I'm just trying to relate where that is stated in the actual study. If it is, I don't know that. I did not. Um, I I discussed in quite a bit of detail the ordinance, but I'm not very good at lawyer stuff. Um, I tend to be more like a farmer. Um, so, apologize for that. Um, I wasn't really sure how this thing was going to, you know, get resolved um, in terms of, you know, the variance request. It was something that just came up last couple of days. So, I apologize for not being more clear on that. 
you know, what it comes down to is there's a provision in the ordinance that says that sort of a generic provision that says, you know, don't, sort of like a Hippocratic Oath, don't do any harm, you know, don't, don't destroy the natural environment, don't mess up drainage patterns any more than you have to. And, you know, I had a discussion in my report that sort of says, okay, if we determine that detention isn't going to be tremendously needed, is it at least sort of an okay thing to do? In other words, why not just do it just to be on the safe side? And then I got some information about the farm tiles and the concerns about the corn stalks and things like that. And when I looked at the site and realized that the driveway that was there six years ago when I looked at it, it's still there, it hasn't washed out, looks like it's in pretty good shape. So, you know, you've got a pretty good draining system out there. Um, I don't see the houses are going to really disrupt it. The driveways, I don't think, are going to disrupt it. Um, so, you know, I actually tried to figure out a way of designing detention without having to dam up the, the ditch. The problem is you get in this over-detention requirement. You know, people say, well, why, why aren't you just releasing rate at the existing runoff rate? Why is it 100 to 10 or why is it 100 to 5 in this case since it's over 10 acres? And the reason that we did that back in the day was a recognition that impervious surfaces not only increase the rate of runoff but also the volume and that doesn't always get accounted for by just saying we're going to release it at the same rate. In other words, if we say we're going to release it at the existing 10-year rate, yeah, flow-wise you might be not increasing it, but volume-wise you're going to get a lot more water over a lot longer period of time. So we decided, and when I say we, government agencies and people I work for, that we do over detention. The problem with over detention is when you get a 13, 12 acre site like this, which most of it's not being developed, most of that detention isn't treating the part of the runoff coming off the impervious surfaces. Most of it is that 100 to 5. You're kind of penalizing the site by requiring detention for runoff coming off areas that aren't being developed. And that's where it gets to be you know, a pretty big size retention pond for the purposes of treating runoff from areas that aren't being developed. Normally, what we do in situations where most of the site, like if I have a big industrial park and a third of it's not going to be developed, it's just going to be left alone. We exempt that out for that over detention, that 100 to 5 or 100 to 10 like they have in Columbus. We just, we apply that to the part of the site that's being developed. And I had that conversation with Mr. May and he said that quite you know, legitimately, no, this applies to the whole site. You have to meet the 100 to 5 for the whole site. In order, you know, so I thought, well, before that, I thought maybe we could do a small detention basin in the backyard before we get to the ditch, maybe individual little, what we call micro basins. Um, but if we're going to do the whole site, 100 to 5, since a lot of the site's south of the ditch, you're going to have to pretty much do something in the ditch itself. And that's where we sort of said, and I actually put modeled together and sized it and said, okay, if we're going to meet these strict standards, we need to dam up this stream with about a four foot high dam, which means water's going to back up and potentially get into these um, these drains. So I thought, well, that's kind of like, you know, shooting one hand for the sake of the other hand in terms of, you know, downstream benefits. Um, and there's so much water coming downstream, you'd only be able to knock that flow down a little bit. So. You know, what we would do if we did do detention, what we would do is we would look at what the impact of an on-site detention pond would be in terms of reduction of the overall hydrology of the watershed, and then we would knock it down that much. So we might knock it down, you know, one or two percent as it's coming through the, the valley. Um, as far as impacts downstream, I don't see it would be a huge benefit. Um, I think it would be... I don't think you would notice it one way or the other. I don't think without detention you would notice you didn't have detention. If you put detention in, I don't see you'd, you'd see a huge reduction downstream because you got so much area flowing through there that you can only knock it down so much. Um, so I apologize for the cumbersome, you know, the clumsy references in that letter. It was kind of put together hastily, but in my report, uh, and I did write a letter to Larry also that summarized this. Um, essentially, it said. It's not, it's not terrible to put detention in, but it doesn't really achieve any benefit. It does cause some potential unintended consequences, and that's why, you know, if I was sitting, you know, in a seat of uh, judgment, I probably would, not wanting to set a precedent, I would probably say, you know, this probably is one of those gray areas where it's not really suitable for detention. But I completely respect whatever you guys do. It won't, won't bother me one way or the other.
I greatly respect you guys coming out on a night of an IU game. I'm a Purdue graduate, but I still follow IU. Is there anyone from the audience who'd like to speak to this? I have a question. The water's running off. Where's it going to? Uh, it's going to the downstream to. Um, Is it going uh, to the golf course? Muddy, yeah, yeah, all that muddy field and everything goes through the golf course. Okay. Back now. How much more water is going to be added on that area from, from our houses? From this house? From the houses. About 0.2% on average. Okay. 0.2%. I just wanted to make sure that's where it was going, not just on right. another house or somebody, you know, like that. So, because I do know they have some flooding down there on, on that back nine. But. Okay, thanks. My concern is when I went out and looked at the front and touched the base on was the culvert where the driveway goes across it. I noticed there was some uh, riffraff put in place there to keep the erosion down. Mm -hmm. And if this were to be approved, uh, would, any, would it help to put more riffraff? I think I think, stream? I think it's always good to put riffraff in. I, I love riffraff. If they put more riffraff in that dam out in California, they wouldn't be fighting. Um, I'm a big fan of riprap, the bigger the better. It's hard to quantify. I can run a computer model on it, and it's as good as the input data, but riprap is it's the greatest thing God ever made to keep erosion down. So I, you know, I don't want to write a check for the developer, but if we needed to add a little bit of extra riprap down there to help keep that, you know, uh, culvert from scouring and maybe provide some goodwill, I think that's fine. I wouldn't have any objection to it from a technical standpoint. Because the, the, the fellow who's got to get to this property and then go down to 150 where the field goes out underneath the road and over to the vault, of course, where eventually drains out. Right. You, know, you don't want to create problems for other people. Well, and you don't want to be the guy that approves creating problems. And no. I understand when you're sitting on this body, you're going to get the phone calls. Ron's going to get the phone calls. And that's why I take what we do very seriously. Because I can sit here and blow smoke up you guys' skirts, and then you guys you get the phone calls, and then some guy in a $600 suit calls me and tells me I'm in trouble. Um, I don't ever want that to happen, so that's why I try to be a straight shooter. And had I believed professionally that there was any real risk to a downstream impact, either flooding, infrastructure damage, property flooding, debris, I would never, ever take a paycheck just to say something because somebody's paying me. I've been doing this for 30 years. My reputation is way more important than a paycheck. Um, and I don't ever want to get that phone call that somebody, you know, Kit Brown or, you know, I mean, I, big ad, I mean, I just got done talking to an attorney about the two kids that drowned up in Edinburgh when they went over that dam. And I told the guy, I said, you guys have to put some signs up, you know, it's, and, you know, it's, it's people die in floods. It's not just petty stuff. And most of them die going in their cars over roads that flood, the driveway. And even a, a little culvert at the downstream end of our site, I assure you somebody could go off that road and die, even in that little tiny culvert. And so, you know, you kind of take this stuff seriously because we're not talking about setbacks or signage. We're talking about, you know, real world hazards where real people get hurt and die and property gets damaged. And, I've been involved in more lawsuits than I can tell you where houses get flooded and I was involved with one you know, last year where a guy died, he hired a plane on the road down in Henryville uh, because the county didn't maintain their roadside ditch and I told the county, I said, pay up, you know, your ditch wasn't maintained, water went over the road, the guy, kid hired a plane on his way to high school, ran into a Mack truck, killed him. And, I, and you know, who would ever think of a drainage ditch along a, a state highway? County road intersecting could cause somebody to die, and every time I do a project, that's what I think about. You know, somebody could die if I screw up. Do any uh, planning commission have any additional questions, Mr. Randy? Yeah, I heard. You guys want to need to recall me down the road? Let me let me know. Um, follow up questions after this. Let me know. I'm at completely your disposal. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone from the audience who would like to speak? Asking additional questions on this side. All right, Ron. Um, 
Chris Hughes. You had a chance to look through this. We're basically down to the a couple options. This is a, I, I would, I've, I've read through this two or three times, and I so said, Chris, he's our legal. I, I take this as written request to the, the, the modification or the exception as it's stated in 123.75. So, if he concurs that the time list is dated prior today, um, I guess where we're at here is approve it, bring this, make a motion, see if we're able to approve, bring this, or stick with the ordinance and say you need to require the petition. Or continue, or just those are about the choices. So I guess I'm asking other commission members their thoughts on the information submitted by the Mayor Group and their feelings on whether requiring detention or not. Well, strictly speaking, strictly from the ordinance standpoint, we would have to require detention unless we would regret we would grant relief from that because Mr. Mann stated that there will be an increase in flow and I believe that the ordinance says that we can't increase the flow. The ordinance in fact requires a net decrease in the flow after development from a 100 year flow, 100 year storm event which is a 1% probability of occurrence in a given year to a I don't even remember ordinance. Marty is a 10 or is uh, it? 5, 5 over 10. Yeah. 0.2 percent. Um, to a 5 year, which is a 0.2 probability of occurrence, 20 percent probability of occurrence in a given year. It's not linear. A 5 year storm is at the 120th of a 100 year storm. Uh, it's probably, it's probably logarithmic, but. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean. It, but it is a reduction. See, but I guess the, the point here was that the increase would be insignificant to the, basically we might be creating more problems than we would be solving if I understand this correctly. So I, I guess the question becomes before us, which way do you want to lean? The one thing that Marty discussed with you that's quite interesting is the beat the peak concept. Um, and I, I believe, Marty, you said you did not actually do that analysis. I didn't. I, I mean, I did it by default, but I didn't really analyze it. Um, there is a possibility, as he said, because this, the, the peak from the 14 acre site, and it's actually two smaller pieces because there's two different outfalls to this thing, but let's just say for sake of discussion, that peak will occur pretty quickly. The total drainage area that goes through the south part of this property is quite a larger area and that peak will occur later and there is a, a real hydraulic possibility that the detention will would increase the total flow even though we reduce the flow off of the 14 acres because that water is going to come out later on in, in stormwater Storm events are a bell curve, basically. They, they start out not much and they peak and they come back down. Um, there is the possibility that delaying that water will actually increase the flow later in the storm event when the remainder of the site is a peak flow. But, but we don't know that without doing a more specific analysis. Right, we could certainly look at that relatively quickly. My name is Steve Dickman. We installed the tile installation for the Sturgeon and Torrances. What we got when you put in tile, you, you actually lower the water table, which makes your soil more like a, a sponge. And so you're going to have less water flow than you ever had before because of the tiling that's been installed. Now, granted, there are tremendous rains that can 
not make that work, but generally speaking, your flow will already be less because of the tile work that's been installed. Another thing, you do have a, some basement drainage and some tile that is existing under that soil. We have no idea where it goes as previous to our work. And so what damage that may do, I don't know. How many tiles do you have? Do you know if it's running that you put in that field that came in for that waterway? You mean no footage? Uh, openings, you know, where they filter out in there. There's just one outlet. One outlet? Is that down uh, there? I correct that. There's one for Mr. Sturgeon. There's one, uh, we had a, we found an old tile that was deeper than our than our outlet could be. So we have a an area where it bleeds up into it now. So, any other questions? Myself, I guess I'd be in favor of granting the exception to the um, detention. Because from what I'm hearing, I'm not sure that we gain anything by requiring the detention pond and may actually make it worse as far as backing that water up that doesn't come from this site, but because we're blocking off the flow through the ditch. That's just my opinion. properties on 631 and 1301 North Anderson Street, which is the northwest corner of 6th and Anderson. And we have another one at 626 West 6th Street. According to county records, each of those two properties are owned by the same people. Um, you see in the upper view here, this is a porch on the west side of the 1301 North Anderson Street property where the porch roof has experienced a structural failure. And this is a window on the west side of the same building that's broken. 
Max will go ahead and probably do the east side. The porch is on the east side? Yes. And the window is on the west side? Yes. Okay. And also, here, there's a hole in the roof in this area right here. Um, I confess to being dilatory and haven't notified these property owners yet, but I will send a letter off to them instructing that they are not in compliance with the building ordinance and um, explaining that they need to resolve these issues or the city will have to intervene. Any questions about this one? Is there, is there a safety problem with that four shot go faster? Hey, it looks like that thing could fall down and it could. It could. The good thing is it is on private property. No way living for sure. Yeah. There was someone residing there approximately about 30 days ago. I'm reluctant to ever make that assessment. <laughs> but they, they may not admit that but they did live there. This is the property at, I've already forgotten the address. 626 West 6th Street. This house has a gable, I'm sorry, a hip roof on it, so this is a load-bearing wall, and it's a little hard to see in the picture. But you notice the wave in the wall. There's something seriously structurally wrong here, and that needs to be addressed at the very least the roof system needs to have an external support until it can be properly addressed but there's there's something really wrong down in here with that wall as i said before this building and the previous one county list is the same property here questions you said you had not sent them a letter yet right so you're about to do that yes yeah. so that is correct. <coughs> we will notify them they need to address the situation. The, the first house that we addressed, their loan, is there any way that we can, like, I don't know, if we have a right to address them, to put like, caution tape around that to where no one can advise them not to get in that property? Or the porch is falling down? I'm glad you asked me that question, Bruce, because since you asked me, I can turn to Chris and say, Chris, what can we do? I didn't rattle the door, as they say, to know if the property was secure. Quite frankly, I wasn't interested in walking up on that porch. No. They, uh, their vehicles have been gone since this has occurred. So, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they just packed up and went on somewhere else. I don't know. Bruce, did you know if there's a meter on there? You like the I do not know. And I looked at the house, and I can't answer that question either, John. <laughs> I should. Oh, man. Of course, there can be um, there can be uh, squatters that don't need electricity. Anything further on these two? property or actually two properties are located at 120 South Franklin Street and 124 South Franklin Street that I believe is the city cafe it's actually the property to the rear and this property if you look at county records and this property are owned by the same individual but I met when I was out there looking at this situation, I met a gentleman that said that he was the owner of this property and that he was in the process of selling that on contract. But until a contract is completed, the county records will continue to show the seller. Is it? So, so it appears to belong to the one gentleman. There is a building that has been removed. I think this is the old roof line. I think this wall came on out. And as you can see, this brick wall 
is badly unsupported and really I, quite unstable. And this is a slightly different view of the same thing. I believe this is a flue over here that's a part of this building. This is the 120 South Franklin building. So uh, this needs to be removed and this area cleaned up. Also, a little hard to see, but in this area down here, um, this wall is a bearing wall, and it was common practice with brick buildings to insert, um, let's call them timber girders, timber beams, into the brickwork and bear on that brick. This area needs to be repointed. There's actually kind of a hole in there. And if we step back, you can kind of see a little bit of an irregularity in the line of the brickwork here. And up here, you see something weird is going on where the bricks aren't paralleling longer. There is some damage. At the very least, that wall needs to be repointed and the holes in it repaired and, and done something to make more durable and more structurally adequate. Again, I have not gotten letters out, but I will. And I don't know that you all need to take any action with this regard. I just bring it to your attention because the meeting worked out this way. And we will get word off to these people and see what kind of response we get. At this moment, we have no business for next month. Every time I say that, it changes. Um, I gave you all your the contact information I have for you, and if, if all of you have it, please uh, update that if necessary and get that back to me, and I can publish that to the rest of you if you want good contact information for each other, or I don't have to. It's really whatever you would like to have there. Um, the city records about when your terms run from and to are a little fuzzy, so if anybody has any information they care to share about that, uh, I think we'd like to get all of you on your proper schedules and get the uh, turnover organized in such a way that a minimal number goes off of the planning commission any one year. Now, of course, there's nothing that I'm aware of that says you cannot be reappointed to the same uh, seat here on the commission, but um, we'd like to get a better handle on expiration dates. Other than that, I, I don't think I'm aware of anything. Do you all have any questions of me? Thank you. Item four, other items of interest from planning commission members. You all passed a motion to grant the waiver on the stormwater management requirements. Did you ever actually approve the subdivision plat? I thought the motion was to approve it with the exception. That's why I took the motion. That's the way I took it. It was. How did it actually state, John? Was that? Move to approve the second. Second plat with the exception. Okay. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. That should have taken care of that. All right. Now, Larry, please. Well, I know you want to get out of here, but I want to take this time to thank the board for their time, your cooperation, and your consideration in Ron. Thank you. Um, King and I are very appreciative. And then we take the time away from your home, your dinner, and all. We'd like to thank you. 